This is Smiles TV. Welcome to Smiles TV. I'm Stephanie Miles and thank you for tuning in. We have a great broadcast for you today. We'll be talking with a gentleman named Mr. Pierre Blaine. And Mr. Blaine has a book called Movement, Race, Power, and Culture in America. You don't want to miss this broadcast. Remember, Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. He was crucified and buried, and he rose on the third day. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. Stay tuned for more smiles. Welcome back to Smiles TV. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our guest, Mr. Pierre Blaine. Mr. Blaine is the author of Movement, Race, Power, and Culture in America. He is a graduate of St. Louis University with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science and a Master's degree in Public Administration. He's Principal Consultant in Blaine and Associates, Public Affairs, Equitable Community Development, and Lobbying. And in the past life, he's a graduate of, graduate of Sumner High School, the oldest black high school west of the Mississippi River, which has been targeted to be closed and he is one of the advocates that the legacy of Sumner not be stuffed out. He was first team all state of Missouri in basketball and listed as one of the best 100 basketball players in Sumner's history. You can read his article in the editorial section of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch published December 21st, 2020, Closing Sumner with Erase Proud Past and depressed social economic mobility. Welcome, Mr. Blaine. It is an honor to have you on Smiles TV. You have a wealthy background. We're going to talk a little bit about your background, but we want to get into that book. How are you today? Very good. I'm so happy to be here with you, and thank you for inviting me. Yes, sir. It is an honor um, that you have uh, allowed us to chat with you today. We're going to talk about your book, Movement, Race, power and culture in America. Just give us a synopsis of your book and then we'll, we'll break it down a little bit. Okay, uh, so movement, race, power and culture in America is a political and economic primer that kind of talks about how the haves are working and have been working, which basically is in my opinion, destroying our democracy and what we should be as a multicultural nation. And so basically I'm talking about uh, the historical context that we have in America as it relates to race, uh, how that has negatively impacted our democracy. And then it talks about how we need to go forward into understanding that what we are talking about in this country right now, in this conversation that we're having about race in America really is a misnomer because race really does not exist the way we talk about it in America. Wow. Okay. That's, that's an interesting point because I've always been of the premise that we are one race, the human yes. race. Yes. And that there, um, you know, we, we have different, um, people from all over the world, but there is one race. So tell, break down that definition of race again for us. So talk to the scientists, when, when, when we talk about science and we talk about biology, uh, basically what they're telling us is that all human beings are 99.99% the same DNA. So therefore, the way we talk about race in America is really a misnomer because as you point out, we are all part of the human race and therefore we are the same. That's right. The concept of race in America, the way uh, it has been implemented in the United States 
is that race is a social and political construct of a classification of a group of people based on skin color. This was used in order to justify the institution of slavery in America. And so this is the way we have uh, interacted with the whole concept of race in America. So really, you know, for the last over 400 years, we have had what we call systematic racism in this country that's basically based upon a lie. Okay, that term, systematic racism, we hear that quite a bit. Um, if you'll tell us your definition well, or the definition of systematic racism. Okay, so my definition of systematic racism is it, it is the denial of human, social, legal, and economic rights against people, a group of people based upon skin color. And the way we got here is because the whole concept of slavery was institutionalized through the law. And this is the reason why it's institutionalized because it was codified into the law. I see, I see. If you had to break down the difference between prejudice and racism, is there a difference? And if so, yes. what is that difference? Prejudice, and we all have prejudices, is a preconceived idea or opinion that you have about something that's basically not based upon any evidence or even your own personal experience. And so it's a perception that you have about a group based upon skin color, which probably is not accurate. We want to differentiate between prejudice, your own personal view about a person, and racism, because in racism, you have to have a power relationship in order to have a negative impact upon my being or my well-being. So if you don't like me because you're prejudiced, you don't like me because I'm black, if you don't have any impact on my life, then that's something that you have to deal with individually. But when a person gets into a power relationship and then you act upon that that power relationship that you have over me based upon your prejudice of skin color, then that's how we get into racism. So a person who is in a power relationship, so that means if you're a teacher, right? If you are a preacher, if you are in government and you have the power to negatively impact my life because of those prejudices, then that moves us into racism. So a person cannot be a racist unless they are able to exercise a personal power over me. So if a person, a person becomes a racist when they cross that line, so if I hit you because of your skin color, then I have exercised a power relationship over you because of my prejudice. I have a question because it's, it's just so strange to me that any group of people to look at a skin color and say, I don't like you because your color is different. What do you think is the innate problem? What drives that kind of hatred for another human being based on color? Well, basically, I believe that that has to be taught. So uh, people who come from backgrounds, uh, you know, we are um, products of our environment. And so if your parents uh, hated black people, right, for example, uh, and then they pass that on to you in their behavior, in the culture, in the way they treated black people or other people, people other than themselves, then that's how that becomes inculcated into our behavior. And so then we reenact those things that basically are based upon a lot. And so this is how uh, the whole concept of racism gets pushed. But the distinction that we try to make uh, as it relates to us in America is systematically put in all of the institutions that we have in the United States of America. And so when it becomes institutionalized racism, then what happens is that we have a denial of our social, economic, you know, political rights based upon skin color, and that is a lie. Wow. 
tell you what, we're going to take a quick break. Okay. And when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about your book, Movement, Race, Power, and Culture in America. Don't go away. Stay tuned. We'll be back with more smiles. When you visit Big Mamas in East St. Louis, Illinois, located at 5900 St. Clair Avenue, you will need a fork and a bib. Big Mamas is known for their barbecue, cakes, excellent service, and giving back to the community. Call in, eat in, drive through, carry out, order for your office. You can call Big Mamas at 618-398-8950 or visit 5900 St. Clair Avenue in East St. Louis, Illinois. Welcome back to Smiles TV. I'm talking with Mr. Pierre Blaine, and he is the author of a book called Movement, Race, Power, and Culture in America. Mr. Blaine, thank you again for being on Smiles TV. And um, I want to talk a little bit more about racism being institutionalized. It's taking you back to the beginning of the Republic so that you can see that Black people are not just whining about the experiences that we're having in this country, especially due to the fact that after 400 years, here we are in the 21st century, and we're still talking about this issue and the, and the fact that it needs to be resolved. So I take you all the way back to the beginning of the Republic. And in the beginning of the Republic, what we see is that as we transferred from the 13 colonies into the United States of America and created the Constitution of the United States of America, what you see there is Blacks were written into the Constitution of the United States of America as three-fifths of a person. And the reason why that was put in was so that the South could then exercise more power, because if you recall in your civics, power in the United States as it relates to representation is based upon the population of the state. So when we go through the census, which we, we have just done in 2020, we look at the population and the number of representatives that you have in the Congress is based upon that population. Well, in the United States, in the beginning, blacks were listed as three-fifths of a person. So what that meant is that the South was able to amass more power as it relates to representation than they would do because they were counting Blacks as three-fifths of a person for representation purposes. So even though Blacks could not vote, mm -hmm. in fact, were legally denied the right to vote, they were given the numbers of the slaves that they had based upon those slave bodies but they were counted as three-fifths of a person, which gave the conservatives in the South really more power than what they deserve. And you can draw a straight line from that to where we are right now in the, in the 21st century, and we are seeing the exact same thing occurring again. And so what I am saying to us is that we have to understand the historical context because when you understand the historical context, that makes you empowered to understand what you're looking at in the present. Blacks were denied the right to vote in which they were subjected to what was called a poll tax. Mm -hmm. Well, the voter ID law is basically the same thing as a poll tax. It is trying to deny Blacks the right to vote. And so when you look at the 21st century, if you don't have that historical context, then you think that the voter ID law is something that you're looking at for the first time, but it's not. It's marked into this thing called a voter ID. And if you have the historical context of the poll tax, then you understand exactly what you're looking at. So understanding the voter ID law, and I, and I hear what you're saying. However, do you think that it also could help in making sure that we have... Um, elections that are done legally. For example, um, I'm, from a sm I'm from East St. Louis, Illinois, and historically speaking, there have been issues with um, people from the, who have died, who are voting, okay? So can't that help 
however, in the identification of the voters. The issue is that the intent of the voter ID law is not to identify who you are. In other words, the studies that have been done so far find very little evidence of voter fraud. In other words, I'm not going into a voter booth and I'm pretending that I'm Stephanie Miles and I'm voting for you. That is not the type of voter fraud that we're having in the United States. Okay. So, so the whole idea, so now, uh, on, his context, on his face, it looks like, well, certainly you should have a voter ID to identify who you are, but that's not what we're talking about. And that's the reason that, that is not the reason why the Republicans are so uh, concerned about having voter ID laws. They're concerned about having voter ID laws because they have been in the process of purging voting rolls, taking people off of the voting rolls and making it harder for people to vote. In fact, if you look at what is happening right now across this country, what you see is state legislatures all across the country doing that very same thing. thing purging the voting rolls, making it harder for you to vote. And that is a disfranchisement of people based upon skin color so that they can have a certain outcome in elections. So, so, so the thing about it is that there are many different ways for a person to be able to identify themselves. And we should give them the full measure of, of being, have, having access to that without denying them the right to vote. Now, if state legislatures are implementing voter ID laws, and let's say that you cannot ID, if the state is willing to pay so that you can get that ID, then I'm okay with it. But if they're forcing you to pay for a voter ID and you don't have the wherewithal to purchase that voter ID from the state, then it's unconstitutional for the state to be imposing that voter ID on you simply because it's against the Constitution. And that was the reason why we passed the 24th Amendment to the Constitution, which abolished poll taxes. Wow. Let me ask you this. Your book, Movement, Race, Power, and Culture in America, you must believe that there is a movement going on. And if so, are we in a movement? And what is that movement? We are in a movement right now because what we're trying to do is to fix injustices, inequality, uh, uh, police brutality. All of these things are on us even now in the 21st century. Basically, what I have been saying is that we are refighting the Civil War. That we have been able to improve the plight of Blacks and other minorities in this country because we have a system in which we can create change. But that can only happen when we the people are involved, we the people are registered to vote, and we the people vote. Got a question for you. What do we need to do to bring about what we call a more perfect union? In order to bring about the more perfect union, we have to do what we've done. And what we have done is number one, in 2020, we came out in record numbers and we we put together, we restitched together the coalition that put Barack Obama in office and we broadened that coalition and that's what brought in new leadership. We have a voting system, we have voting rights and we have to continue to vote for those rights and we cannot allow individuals who are going to disenfranchise us by telling us that you know, we are uh, promoting election fraud because as I said before, there's no evidence. Well, let me ask you this. How can people get your book? If, if anyone wants to get it, how can people get your book? Okay, my book is available on amazon.com. And so basically you go out to Amazon and you put in the name of the book, purchase the book uh, online and uh, the book will get to you in three to four days. There's a story about one of the founders of the United States, Benjamin Franklin. And after they created the uh, uh, Constitution of the United States, it is reported that a woman asked Dr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin, what kind of government have you given us? And it's reported that he said to her, a republic, if you can keep it. Hmm. Our jobs as Americans is to support freedom, justice, and equality in America. 
that we need to vote in all elections. And if we are not registered to vote, we need to become registered to vote. And we know that this enfranchise any person as it relates to voting in America. Well, let's, let's narrow this down. I know I said that was the last question, but you're, you've been working diligently in our area here in, in the St. Louis, Missouri metropolitan area, um, working with the Sumner High School, um, historically um, black high school that's much needed in, in the St. Louis area. What's going on with that now? Um, I understand um, they were talking about closing it, but it looks like things are changing. Yes. Where does that stand? And if you can speak to that real briefly. Uh, Sumner High School will remain open for at least three more years. The reason why that is significant and one of the arguments that I was making as to why is because in the state of Missouri, it was illegal for Blacks to read and write. So there was no place in Missouri for Blacks to, to finish high school. And so Sumner was the first Black high school west of the Mississippi River that allowed Blacks to be able to vote. There is a complete Salt Charles Sumner that is who the school is named after. He was a white senator from the state of Massachusetts. Okay. There is a, there is a direct line from preventing Blacks to be able to read and write, preventing you from being able to vote. And there's a straight line from that all the way to people climb the walls trying to attack the Capitol because they don't like other people. They don't like otherness. They don't like you if you're not white. What we need to do is to try to fight to keep that, that school open, to keep that legacy going, and then to be able to educate people why that's important, because when you lack the historical context, then you are going to repeat history in ways that are not beneficial to not just Black people, but for the democracy that we claim to love here in the United States of America. Well, Mr. Bryan, I want to thank you for being a guest on Smiles TV. Um, you have a wealth of information, and I, I hope you'll come back sometime to do another broadcast with us. And, and then we'll okay. your work for um, Sumner is paying off because um, things look like they're moving in the right direction. So we do thank God for you. And I want to remind our viewing audience, if they want to get your book, um, they can go on Amazon. There it, it is. is. Holding the book up right there. Um, <laughs> Go on Amazon yes. and, and support Mr. Blaine. Thank you again uh, for being on. Thank Smiles you so much. Today. And yes. um, I, I, I used to ask all of my guests if you'll come back, but I'm gonna put you on the spot. If you get an opportunity, will you come back again? Absolutely. Okay. Well, we thank you, and we thank you for tuning into Smiles Television Talk Show. And and just remember that only what you do for Christ will last. And Jesus is the Lord the Lord be magnified. When in need of residential and commercial construction projects from roofing, siding, flooring, including all interior carpentry, painting, and more, you need a company that is efficient, effective, and professional. A company that will complete the job on time. You need On Time Contracting Incorporated. On Time Contracting provides quality work completed in a timely manner. Oliver McDowell, founder and owner of On Time Contracting, is insured and bonded and provides an array of services for residential and commercial facilities. Contact On Time Contracting for your many residential or commercial construction, roofing, cleaning, or other needs at 618-567-3591. That's 618-567-3591. On Time Contracting Incorporated. Your project can indeed be completed on time. The Smiles Television Talk Show wants to showcase your business, organization, church, and activities. If you have an interest in being a guest on Smiles Television Talk Show, or if you have any show ideas, contact Stephanie Anthony Miles at smilestv777 at gmail.com. You may also call 618-741-3770. Tell your friends to subscribe to the Smiles YouTube channel. Let Smiles TV increase your reach. Remember, you look better with smiles. Hi. IDEX Media does a lot. From IDEX Photography to IDEX Films. We help create forever memories and forever impressions.
Imagination. Image a world. IDEX Media. Awesome sauce. Yeah, baby. Mm. Well, well.